You're listening to Go with Jamarlin Martin. We have a go hard or go home approach as we talk to the leading tech leaders, politicians, and influencers. Let's go. Today we have Bari Williams, VP of Legal Affairs and Policy at All Turtles, author. Uh, you may have uh, read her great work in New York Times, Wired, and Fortune. Uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about how you got into tech and started working at tech companies. What was your path yeah. uh, there? Um, so when I was in law school and I, I went to law school because I wanted to, I wanted to understand how law was actually created because I think that understanding the creation process of it also helps you, this is going to sound not necessarily as positive, but how to weaponize it. And I feel like in marginalized communities, it's weaponized against us. So I wanted to learn how can I use it as a, as a tool. Um, but in terms of tech, my family, I argue a lot. I argue in person. I argue on the internet. I argue on the street. Ja Rule. Ja Rule. <laughs> with Ja Rule. Look, I just answered that man's questions. Yeah, yeah. He asked me some questions. I responded. They weren't the best questions. But so my family thought I was going to be a litigator. And, you know, oh, you should be a DA or a public defender. And I actually spent my first year and my first summer at a firm that specialized in litigation. I hated it. It was completely boring. Um, And I actually found that litigation to me is destructive. And the work that I do in transactional, in terms of terms of service and contracts, you're creating a business, so it's it's constructive. And I wanted to be a part of something that's building as opposed to something that where there's a clear winner and a loser. Yeah. So second summer in law school, I went to a firm that specialized probably 75% in tech transactions. And when you do well um, as a summer associate, they offer you a full-time role. And so that's that's where I went after law school. And from there, I went in-house at different companies. Okay. And uh, you have like three degrees. Four. Four. Uh, let's, can you uh, share those degrees with our audience? Yes. Yeah, so um, my undergrad degree is it's in mass communications and a minor in African-American studies. I have an MBA. Uh, I have a master's in African-American studies. And I have a JD. Okay, I read about you uh, back when you were working at Facebook. Uh, how long were you there? Two and a half years and some change. Yeah, I and left right before uh, New Year's in 2016. Did you work with Maxine Williams? Uh, to an extent, but she's yeah. in diversity, so I didn't work yeah. with her a ton. But okay. I definitely worked with her in an informal sense. Um, when I created the supplier diversity program at Facebook and then yeah. I was part of the, uh, the black employee resource group leadership team. So we had to work with her to, for programming and things. And how was it working there? Uh, excuse me, you were working there way before everything starts crashing down. Yeah. yeah. Including my stock price. Um, <laughs> I need that back up, <laughs> yeah. but, um, no, it, it was fun. I will say, and what I think is interesting to even see the difference between employees of color that work there and, and majority folks is it never gets old to them. Like the whole like free food and ice cream shop. And, and I did go to that dessert shop probably three out of five days a week when I was there for the first three months. Um, and they call it the Facebook 15 because you're so excited that everything is free that you're just eating everything. Yeah. And After a while, I mean, you know, the novelty of it wears off and you're really looking at, like, what do I do on a day-to-day basis? Yeah. And I found that most of the employees of color were reflective in that way, particularly after three to six months. And other people, it just doesn't get old. It's like, yeah, let's go hang out. We're going to bar crawl on the mission. And yeah, it's just a completely different a completely different existence. So there was a um, an engineer. Uh, you probably saw this uh, where he left Facebook. He wasn't there. He was maybe he was there less than a month. Another senior brother blasted him, and then the engineer who left, who said Facebook was racist. Oh, um, you're talking about okay. So I I don't know the individual. So that's Mark. Mark. Um, he actually was over like black influencer engagement on the platform as part of uh, the, what is that group called? It's partnerships team. Yeah. And so he would work with uh, influencers, famous people of different races, t- typically people of color. And I, I'm not sure if he focused 
uh, on the African diaspora in particular or black folks, but I tend to believe that that's what it was. Yeah. And he made some very interesting observations that are not far from the truth. Yeah. Like I've seen people get stopped before. Like, where's your badge? Or if you're walking with a guest and, and they ask like, who are you with? Cause clearly like I can't be the employee and this is my guest. It's like, well, who, who's with, who brought you? Yeah. <laughs> um, so that you, you do get a bit of that. Um, and then I think, and it's, it goes back to a lot of the things that I write about is you can't have homogenous groups making decisions for a global population. Yeah. It just isn't going to work. Things are going to break. He says, and Zuckerberg says, well, they're going to break. And break things. Yeah. Yes. And they will break or they will never get made, which yeah. sometimes is worse. And so if you don't have somebody at the table who can say, okay, well, this is a, this product is great. It's a good idea. But how would someone who's blind use this? Or how are you marketing this in this particular community? Have you thought about the use case for if someone has this data, how could it be weaponized against them? I mean, it, it, Facebook is good for a lot of things, but I think that it is actually having to level set and understand like the role that they played in essentially subverting democracy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, you, you yeah. Cambridge Analytica, I wrote on this last year with... Um, one of my friends who was a politics professor and Cambridge Analytica, the whole point of it, you're using data to essentially enfor to encourage voter suppression and voter depression. So it's like, even if you, you know, if you're thinking about voting, Hillary's not really good for you. Just yeah. don't even bother. Don't come out. There was an article in the Washington post where the writer said Facebook was psychopathic in terms of culture and what it has done. And, yeah. you know, when you look at the definition of that word, you know, you're thinking about... I think oh, that's uh, a bridge too far. Okay. Um, now, I will, I will say that it can seem that way, particularly when you meet all of these fresh-faced people who are straight out of undergrad and this is their first job. I always wondered, like, what... How do you go up from here, right? Because you, you're coming out of a dorm where you had free food, and you're going straight into a job where you have free food. And it's kind of like you're never forced to be an adult. And you can see some of that. But for people that were older and had worked other places, it was it was different. But it, it is a there is an undercurrent of being very careful about how you frame things. If there are issues or problems, how do you frame them? Who do you bring them to? And how do you surface them? Because it's. Facebook has a, they have this saying and it's on posters, says, assume good intent. So you always want to assume that someone is, is telling you something because it's valuable or be good for you. But all that news isn't always going to be good, right? And so if you're assuming that I'm coming with you, coming to you in good intent, but you don't like what I'm saying, you're going to discount it. So it's, there's a CNN special, I believe, on it on Sunday where there is like a, <laughs> And I, when I first saw the commercial, I kind of, I laughed. But it's a guy whose voice is essentially masked and jumbled. And he's like, Facebook is a cult on the inside. And please disguise my voice. I don't want them to know it's me. It's just like, come on. What was like the final straw in terms of why, why did you leave uh, Facebook? <laughs> you know how many times my mother has asked me that? Um, it wasn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say a straw so much as I knew that I wanted, I was capable of doing more and of being more. And when I let, when I joined Facebook, I think it was like 8,300 people, which was already, you know, big. Yeah. And when I left, I think it was like 17 or 18,000. You're a cog in a wheel at that point. Yeah. So there's only so much you can do. And I felt like I always like to leave a place better than how I found it. And I feel like I did that to a certain extent with supplier diversity. I did that through ERG work. I did that through my regular contractual work. But one thing that, you know, all large companies are guilty of is they want to make sure that if you are speaking and you are presented as someone that is of and from the company, they want to control the narrative and the message. And I'm not, like I don't the, work that way. Control so. freaks over there. Well, uh, I wouldn't say yeah. control freaks, but you always, you know, you want to be mindful that if you're, 
someone is speaking and they're representative of your company that whatever they're saying isn't going to shine a bad light on the company yeah, or, you know, isn't going to be something super controversial. Cause the first thing it would say is like Barry Williams, Facebook employee said, blah, 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 blah. You know, they don't want they don't want that with the control freaks. I'm talking about more kind of externally where, uh, they, with their public relations, uh, teams and lobbyists, they seems like, it seems like they are very aggressive in mm-hmm. trying to manipulate and control the, the narrative. Maybe more so than a than a Google. Mm, I, so full, my husband works at Google, so I okay, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> but I will yeah. I will say this: it's the same. And I've been on panels with um, black employees from Google, and the conversations that we've had have been around like, well, how did you, you know, not circumvent, but how did you figure out a way to say what you wanted to say? and the company was okay with it. And it's just, again, it's about how you phrase things, who you surface them to, and always leading with how is this beneficial to the company and not necessarily just me as an employee. That's the other thing that a lot of these companies, particularly the large ones, they don't want but a certain number of people that are going to essentially represent the brand. So when you think of Facebook, you think of Mark and Cheryl. You don't think of, you know, you don't think of Joel who heads policy, but you know, it's something that You're talking about Joel Kaplan. Yes. Yeah. So you don't, but even you don't think of Joel, you think of Cheryl, you think of Mark and that's kind of it. And on a, and on occasion, you know, twice a year, you think of Maxine when she comes out and says, here are our numbers and this is what we're doing. But aside from that, they're very strategic about who they want. And Google is the same way. You don't think of, you know, it's some random product manager. You think of Sergey. You don't think of, you know, anyone else. I'm going to switch gears here. Uh, you probably read about the scandal related to Jeff Bezos and the National Enquirer, where uh, his team is now saying that they believe that uh, MAGA may have used our uh, foreign government mm-hmm. working uh, in alliance surveillance. with surveillance. Yeah, surveillance, mm-hmm. the uh, intelligence agency. In have order been involved to of, blackmail someone to get them to stop giving you bad news, essentially. Yeah. So, so, so Jeff Bezos says, Crazy. "Hey, you know, I'm being blackmailed." And so that brings up a quote by Donald Trump that I pulled from Vanity Fair. Donald Trump says last year, "I happen to know some United States senators, <laughs> uh, one who is on the other side, who is pretty aggressive." I've seen that person in very bad situations, okay? I've seen that person in very, very bad situations, somewhat compromising. And you know, I think it's very unfair to bring up things like this. But yet you bring it up. Yeah, so, 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 <laughs> so he's, he suggested that he could kind of blackmail a U.S. senator uh, last year, Donald Trump. Uh, and then last year, the media kind of started speculating about no, not last year. It was a, a few years ago. He said he knows more about Cory Booker oh, than God. Cory Booker knows about himself. Yeah. Do you think uh, that there's, let's say, a, a greater than 30% probability that when Donald Trump said he had blackmail material on Cory Booker, I mean, on a U.S. senator, that it was Cory Booker? I don't know if it's Cory Booker. I honestly think it could it could be it could anybody. Be, it could be a lot of people. It could yeah. be anybody because I don't put anything past this administration. Um, and the thing that was so interesting to me with um, uh, Amazon is think of all the people who were blackmailed that didn't just out themselves. Yeah. That was the first thing I thought was, well, how many people have they done that to that just paid whatever it was? Yeah, they're bringing this white criminal, corporate yeah. criminal culture to the surface. Yes, yeah. and that's the thing that's so interesting to me is, you know, everything is witch hunt, no collusion, whatever. but like, you know, you are who you hang around. And if everybody around you is going to prison, I'm going to probably think you're a criminal. So, and I have no doubt that he would use surveillance in a way to essentially gather, you know, it's Apple research. That's how he's using it. Yeah. And it's uh, no different to me than how you have J. Edgar Hoover following people for decades. It's the same idea. Yeah. So the only reason I mentioned uh, Cory Booker in relation to Donald Trump's claim that uh, he has some blackmail material 
on someone is last week, Cory Booker at a press conference would not admit that Donald Trump was racist. Oh, God, yeah. So that was uh, the, um, I don't know what's in his heart. I'll leave that to the Lord. That's what he said. And I remembered yeah. it because I was like, what? What? Just say yes or no. Why can't you just say that? Yeah. Well, well <clears throat> and I think the reason for that, and the next day on Meet the Press, Sherrod Brown, uh, I'm, Chuck Todd asked him the same thing. And he's like, do you think he, the president's a racist? And he's like, what do you mean? And he said, well, in his heart, do you believe? And he's like, well, I don't know what's in his heart, but yes, I do. And he says racist things and he does racist things. And if you're not sure. So you're saying, yeah, yeah, a lot of white Democrats. I think uh, that's because it's, it, you can't play both. It's hard, right? Cause Corey is a, is a, a black man. And so for him to come out and say, yes, Donald Trump is a racist. He's already lost like, you know, two thirds of the white electorate and considering his, his background, I think that that's very important to him. Like Stanford, Yale, Oxford, Rhodes Scholar. Yeah, he'd take a lot of pharmaceutical money. And I, I yeah, think for but, him that that's, he really wants to walk a fine line and not alienate a potential voting base. Yeah. Now you lost another piece of the voting base because now the re- everybody else is like, oh, okay, well, you just can't call a spade a spade. Yeah, I find it troubling that he can't uh, say that Donald Trump is racist and so many white Democrats uh, can. He, it's not like he's trying to uh, make this the center of his campaign. He's not trying to talk to Dr. Uh, Donald Trump. But the fact that just a side question, he can't say that he's he's racist and um uh, i do believe that there's a uh, based on the chronology of events about uh with donald trump and blackmail and saying that i know a lot of things about cory booker cory booker he's in new jersey that it seems like it could fit within this uh blackmail box oh i, uh, I wouldn't doubt it does cory booker get you excited no in terms of no uh 2020? no kamala harris yes okay why Okay, full disclosure, I supported her initial campaign for attorney general um, and have fundraised for her subsequently. Okay, so you've been riding with her. This is nothing new for you. No, been, yeah. down, been down since, since 06, 07. So, yeah, okay, got it. Okay, so, so you, you OG, kind of, you've been on the team for a while. Yes, yeah. and I, um, it was funny, I, when I was in law school, I had her speak at an event, at a BALSA event. Yeah. And she was the DA and like everyone loved her and thought she was going to go on and do great things. But if you would have told us, you know, like 12 years from then that she would be running for president, I don't think anybody would have necessarily thought it would be that fast. Um, but if I had to pick between Kamala and Corey, I'm picking Kamala. And I, it's also I, I'm full. I'm, I'm more I'm more familiar with her record. I'm less familiar with Corey's because I'm not, I'm, I'm not in Jersey. Yeah. And I don't, I just. You have a geo bias uh, towards mm-hmm. uh, Harris. Do some of the criticisms uh, of uh, Kamal Harris, specifically from black men, do they get you upset? Yes. Can you, for the audience, can you share <laughs> some of the criticisms where, hey, I wish somebody and I could just punch you. There them. is, so there is a. I don't remember who posted it, but there was a video of her dancing to Cardi B and she had her hair pulled back in a ponytail and she was clearly working. And somebody was like filming this from like the side of the table. And I just saw so many men post that on Twitter, like, oh, look, she's pandering for black people, but she doesn't actually say she's black. And she's, you know, look, she's trying to show off her edges. And I was just like, how stupid is this? Yeah, that's not a legitimate critique. It's not even, the, but their whole thing was like, she's pandering because, okay, look, she's literally, it was like, she's trying to show her edges. She's dancing to Cardi B. Do you think she sits around with her husband who was white and they listen to Cardi B? And it's like, yeah, I actually believe that they do. Yeah. Because he also has teenagers. <laughs> yeah. So it's fully possible, if not probable. But, and and everything is like, oh, well, she's a cop. She just wants to put us all in jail. And it's like, no, what? No. If you actually dig into her record, and a lot of what they criticize her about, too, is the truancy. Her aims to, to limit truancy when she was DA in San Francisco. It turned into something where she would penalize parents. And the way that they 
have twisted that is just it's just so bothersome and you know picking at like well she wouldn't she wouldn't do anything um for prop eight like she wouldn't defend it in court and it's well why is that a problem for you like so if she supports the lgbtq community she can't support black people like how does that it's not a mutually exclusive proposition so it's it's annoying because I feel like people are discounting her and a lot of the criticism is around, is she black enough? And that's what I don't understand. Like the woman went to Howard and is an alpha chapter, AKA like, what do you want her to do? Yeah. Set so out a step every time her she husband, how she's dancing to Cardi B. Yeah. Her hair. Uh, this stuff is out of pocket. And it seems like there's nobody is out here yeah. talking about Corey being a single black vegan. Nobody's yeah. talking about that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I don't think... Like, is that is that down? But I think Kamala's, a, Kamala's a, a, a bigger issue, though, because... Well, because she's a woman. People are checking for her, and people are trying to filter, but no one, mm-hmm. at least when I travel the country, I don't see a lot of people in the community checking for Cory Booker. So, to me, it would be uh, natural that they're talking a little bit more about uh, uh, Kamala Harris. Now, my personal issue has nothing to do with some of this what i would call out of pocket uh criticism that it's not valid uh but her record uh in california uh in terms of big tech uh, in terms of uh consumer privacy regulations where i'm cool i can live uh with you being a cop i may even can live based on the options you were a little bit more aggressive than I'm comfortable with. I could possibly still vote for you. Uh, but were you policing the corporate actors with the big wallets, with the big connections, uh, like the New York AG would be policing Wall Street? Uh, is it fair uh, to criticize the, the record there? When she, when Kamala Harris was AG. Well, what's actually, what's funny is when she was initially running for AG, she was running against the guy who had been Facebook's original uh, general counsel and he was a Republican and she beat him. So uh, clearly people were interested in seeing someone who was not in and of that community be responsible for making sure there was oversight of it. Yeah. Now, to a certain extent, do I think that she necessarily did a fantastic job in terms of privacy regulation. I don't, I wouldn't, I would, I don't know that I can say yes or no to that. Yeah. And I think a large part of it is also based off of where I sit, having worked in tech and being in legal at a big tech company, everybody was signing away their privacy rights to play candy crush. And nobody realized any of this until last year. And I don't know that that's necessarily her fault. I think it's that a a lot of the companies were playing hide the ball and the ball dropped. And now people are paying a ton of attention to that. There is a consumer privacy law that is in place, starts January 1st, 2020 in California. And she did advocate for that. And it allows you to control how your information and your data is used, which is, is probably going to be the most stringent privacy law in the nation. But I think what's what we will see, particularly in the next 18 months, is you will see federal federal regulation around that because it's not a game anymore. Like if you're using social media and technology to subvert democracy, like all bets are off. So but in terms of consumer privacy, she fought the banks with the subprime mortgage lending. And she actually went back and got more money for California than they were initially offering in the settlement. So she she does care about these things and she does try. I think you also have to understand that California is, and I I believe that people do to a certain extent, what is, is politically expedient for them. And California is not as blue as people think that it is. It's the Bay is blue where I live. LA is blue. Uh, Maybe a pocket of San Diego. The rest of that is agricultural and very, very red. So you also have to be mindful that she's not, she can't play like super, super left of center. Like it just, that wouldn't work in the electorate. So she had to pivot 
to get where, where, where she is, like many politicians, essentially. They may not have fully reflected her values. Right. And sense. I don't, yeah, I mean, I it's think. It's like, hey, some of you people out there in the streets, you guys are being a little bit naive about this game. It's just like yeah. when you go into a job or something like that. Stop being so naive. Mm -hmm. uh, she's had to play like many others have had to play. Well, I mean, it's the same thing when she was DA and there was a, a, a man who had killed a police officer and she would not pursue the death penalty. And that, that was her own personal feeling. And then, of course, when she turns around and runs for state AG, they're like, well, would you not pursue the death penalty for people? And she pivoted. I mean, in certain cases, yes. Other cases, no. I don't remember the particulars of that case uh, where she didn't pursue it as DA. I think it was in like 03 or 04. But police officers, the unions were very upset about that. Yeah. And I, I understand. But I also think, you know, when there are moments where you can take a personal stance in your position, why not do that? And that's what she did. Yeah, so some of the criticism relates to a report she influenced some decision related to Steve Mushnin's uh, bank, the current treasury secretary, during the, I guess, the crisis where yeah. his bank wasn't penalized. Uh, is that unfair to yes. scrutinize that? Yes. Why you, is that unfair? You, well, because first off, of the so the pool of money, and particularly around when everything was too big to fail and you had everything crushing down because of subprime lending, the state AGs got together to try to get a certain amount of money in a pile of money. I don't know that it's fair when you're dealing with 50 people, essentially, to put all of that weight on one. Like, I just don't think that that's fair. Yeah. And she went back and negotiated more money than the rest of the state AGs were going to take. So, so you, you don't think it was like, hey, someone made a phone call. Don't prosecute this one in terms of how the game is played. I don't think so. You don't think so? Mm -mm. I was going to say, uh, I Senator Harris so. needs you on the stump uh, <laughs> because I think you're a really good defender of her. Uh, well, about, and I want to be about, clear. It's not about necessarily defending her. I think for me, and I feel this way about anyone's record. Like I, I went looking at some stuff that people criticized Corey about last week about taking big pharma money and he voted against capping drug prices. And then, well, there were other things that were in that bill, which is why he voted against it. And also, if he's voting against that, like, that's not necessarily in his best interest. So it's, I think for me, it's really trying to understand the nuance of why people do what they do and to understand that sometimes you may have a particular policy in mind in a way you want it to play out, and it goes left. Like, it doesn't, it, that's like everyone's plans in life. Everything's not going to go the way that you hope that it will. And so the best thing you can do is try to salvage what you can of it. And I think people are not nuanced. People read headlines, people read tweets, people want to read hot takes. They're not going to click on the actual article and read the whole article or read the nuance and understand why that bill didn't pass or why this person voted that way. For me, that's, that's what I want to understand because that also lets me know what is your logic and how do you think. This is part one. Tune into the next episode for part two. Thanks, everybody, for listening to Go. You could check me out at Jamal and Martin on Twitter and also come check us out at moguldom.com. That's M-O-G-U-L-D-O-M.com. Be sure to subscribe to our daily newsletter. You can get the latest information on crypto, tech, economic empowerment, and politics. Let's go.